Good day. I'm Colonel Jerry Morlock, the director of the Combat Studies Institute. You're about to use a video series which our instructors have prepared for the sole purpose of improving your presentation of M610, The Evolution of Modern Warfare. We've taken care to make the course that you teach as similar to the one taught at Fort Leavenworth as possible and choose to add these tapes to your libraries in order to give you every advantage as you prepare to teach this new course. These tapes are similar to the weekly train-up sessions which we utilize to prepare our instructors here at Fort Leavenworth. My intent for the tape sessions was to provide you insights and tips on ways to approach the lessons of M610 that were not available in the instructor notes. I've drawn various instructors, military and civilian, into the sessions based upon their specific expertise and historical background. They were asked to just talk to the lesson structure and content, giving you some additional information on the historical context and differing views on how to approach the lessons. These tapes will provide you a wealth of knowledge and direction that will significantly improve your readiness to teach our new history course. One word of caution regarding how to use these training tapes. They are not designed to be substituted for your instruction during the individual lessons of the course. As instructor preparation tapes, train the training material if you will, they are inappropriate for direct instruction to students and are not intended for that purpose. Our intent with these tapes is to improve your ability to lead the student seminars by sharing tips and advice from some highly qualified experts. The Combat Studies Institute stands ready to provide whatever additional expertise or assistance that you may require, and we've included the Institute's phone, mail, and email contact information on the tape if you should need it. Good luck with the Evolution of Modern Warfare course, and have a good time. Good morning or good afternoon uh, from uh, Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. This is the Combat Studies Institute. I'm Lieutenant Colonel Sylvia Pierce. Uh, to my right is Lieutenant Colonel Dr. James Martin. And to my left is uh, Dr. Larry Yates. Dr. Yates is the author of the introduction to this lesson uh, and to one of the uh, lesson articles. This lesson is Lesson 7, The Men Against Fire uh, and the Colonial Warfare from 1864 to 1914. Uh, this particular lesson is a bridge lesson uh, between the American Civil War and World War I. Uh, lots of things happen during this particular uh, time frame and we're going to look at this uh, in two different uh, venues. One, the colonial warfare venue and the other one uh, leading into the men against fire into World War I. Larry. Okay. Uh, just to, uh, in context, and I'd start out by putting this lesson in context for the students, although they'll get most, if not all of that, in the introductions they read, but points to emphasize would be that, uh, as Sylvia said, the 19th century is a period of change, and it sets the stage uh, following the Napoleonic Wars for modern warfare, which we'll see uh, in World War One, or a new kind of war, a more lethal battlefield. What's happening? First of all, nationalism, which you uh, saw as a result of the French Revolution, becomes much more widespread and much more pronounced during the 19th century. Uh, much of Europe, if not all of Europe and the West, become very nationalistic. Um, you have industrialization. Some would call it the Industrial Revolution, although others would argue something that takes 200 years in the making isn't a revolution, but the term sticks. You, there's a more rapid industrialization in the 19th century than there had been before that, uh, especially in Western Europe, uh, but throughout Europe and it will extend to the United States. A point to remember in the context uh, mainly of colonial warfare and then what follows is that by the uh, end of the 19th century the United States has become the foremost industrialized power in the world. Uh, we've overtaken both the British and the Germans who had a head start on us. Uh, another uh, aspect or another uh, phenomenon to come out of the 19th century would be a number of ideologies trying to cope with this new world. World. Uh, social Darwinism. Uh, that may be more of a philosophy than an ideology, but the idea that uh, 
Darwin's theory of the origins of the species and survival of the fittest can be transposed from the biological realm to the social realm and the international realm. And at the, in the latter, uh, that uh, country, or the strong countries will survive over the weak, they will prevail over the weak, they will dominate the weak. Uh, this will be a rationale for, uh, for imperialism, for example. Um, and imperialism itself will be a product of the 19th, uh, 19th century, at least a new form of imperialism, uh, by and large economically motivated, although there are other justifications for it as well, which I discuss in the introduction. But uh, the economics, you want markets, you want, uh, you want markets for your surplus goods, goods you produce at home but you can't sell at home, you need to sell them abroad. If you can't do that, you're gonna have a depression. Uh, capital, you can only invest so much at home or reinvest so much to keep the shoe factories uh, growing until they can't produce enough uh, to, uh, that can be or they can produce too much to be sold at home. Uh, why invest more money in that factory? Invest it somewhere else. Well, overseas is one place to invest it. Uh, so markets for surplus goods, surplus capital, also uh, the need to control sources of raw materials. Uh, this will lead to an imperialistic uh, uh, venture in the uh, uh, throughout the 19th century the, the big wave comes in the 1880s 1890s but you see it throughout the 19th century in the case for example of the French uh, technology the Industrial Revolution brings about uh, uh, new technology and for the first time now uh, in, in this particular course we're going to see technology making a difference. Today when we talk about revolutions in military affairs we always talk about the, the technology. This is what triggers the revolution. Uh, we've seen uh, radical changes in military affairs up to the 19th century that had nothing to do with technology. That had more to do with philosophy, with leadership, uh, Napoleon being an example. Napoleon didn't have any technology that was radically different from his uh, those who went before him, his predecessors. But uh, he he had certain uh, uh, his conception of the battlefield, his leadership ability, his strategy, uh, his formations, etc. Uh, many for which he was responsible. Some of which he just like the core he just modified and used for his own ends. But the point is, uh, it had not little or uh, very little to do with technology. Now technology is going to play a big part in uh, the shaping of modern warfare. So, uh, so the 19th century, a very critical period in terms of uh, not only the world as a whole, in terms of the westernization of the world, but also in terms of the military. Uh, uh, new ideologies, uh, new technology that will have an effect on military affairs. Now, in the one sense where it does, as we've already said, is colonial warfare. Imperialism, uh, the outward expansion mainly of the European powers, although you, uh, by the end of the century you're getting Japanese expansion as well, Japanese imperialism. But imperialism, colonial warfare is primarily a product of the Western world, Western Europe and then the United States. And what I would suggest for this lesson, given the readings that you have, is that one, you provide the context, as I've just done here very briefly, the introduction gets into it a bit more, but the background for, uh, in, in which, or the background uh, for the 19th century in which colonial warfare takes place. Uh, I would talk about the problem. What, what, what is colonial warfare all about? Well, it's to establish colonies and then to maintain them uh, and to keep others out and to keep the indigenous population uh, subdued or happy, one of the two or both. Uh, what policies can you pursue in colonial war? Uh, what tactics do you use? And what is the impact of colonial warfare on the military? This is the way I would divide it. Again, context, the issue or problem at hand, the policies pursued, the tactics pursued in pursuit of the policies, and uh, the impact of all of this on the military. So, uh, and just going down some of these points, discussing them in general, and then we'll look specifically at the French and the US. Uh, the context, again, is 
uh, industrialization, nationalism, uh, 19th century movements, uh, colonial expansion. Uh, the main wave, as I said, started in the 1880s, but the French are at work uh, and others are at work even before that. Uh, it's the West, it's the ascendancy of the West. This is where the West really takes over most of the world. Not all of it, but most of it. And what hasn't been colonized up to this point will be. We're talking mainly about Africa and Asia, parts of Asia. Uh, the Western Hemisphere, Latin America, is off limits. The Monroe Doctrine uh, establishes uh, the uh, precedent, at least, or the, the policy that the United States doesn't want to see Europeans colonize or recolonize Latin America. Uh, what will happen to Latin America, that's for another day. But uh, So the colonial expansion, mainly Africa and Asia, but uh, again, most of the world that hasn't been divided up will be. For the military and for the government that uh, runs the military, the problem is to establish a colony when ordered to do so, uh, often over over the resistance of an indigenous population, and then to maintain that colony by keeping the locals down and the foreigners out. Uh, your basic problem or your basic issue. The policies for doing this, uh, you can uh, talk about, you can divide them into the harsh policies, the benevolent policies. This is what uh, the, way, the way the United States described them at the turn of the century. We used plain English back then and not jargon. So uh, the harsh policy simply meant uh, subjugating the population, making the locals accept colonial rule, even if they didn't want to, and in many cases they didn't. Uh, it's a policy of raid of burning villages, of uh, uh, punishing those who resist, but using force to establish your colony. The benevolent approach was to try to convince the local population that they wanted to be a colony, that being uh, colonized would work to their benefit as well as the benefit of the mother country, meaning the colonizer. Uh, you would build an infrastructure, you'd set up a marketplace, and uh, you would convince the locals that this they would be better off under French or US or English or German or Italian rule than they would be on their own or under their current situation. Uh, so today the programs we would refer to as nation building, civic action, civil affairs. This is the, uh, the benevolent approach. In most cases you get a combination of the harsh and the benevolent. It's a question of which is going to have the emphasis and at what time. Generally early on uh, if, if it's a combined approach, the emphasis will be on the harsh policy because you're setting up the colony over resistance. And then over time, you try to convince more and more people to go along with it. So, uh, and, and the benevolent approach will take uh, precedence over the harsh approach. But it just depends on where you are and when you're there. In some cases, the French will use a harsh approach throughout. Uh, uh, in the case of the Philippines, it'll be a mixed approach with uh, an initial emphasis on the benevolent, then it goes to the harsh, and then back to the benevolent. So uh, the main thing is there are two different approaches, and you'll see generally a combination of the two, one form or another. The tactics used in colonial warfare, this, we can go on forever on this, but we'll try not to, uh, they tend to be unconventional. And the problem here is, is that initially, at least, the armies going in to colonize an area tend to be traditional armies, conventional armies. European armies that are used to fighting on a, uh, a linear battlefield against a, a well-defined opponent, and you, you simply exchange volleys, et cetera, until, and then charge or defend until one side prevails. But they're used to traditional warfare, large units, big formations, volley fire, et cetera. Uh, in the local situations that they find themselves in colonial warfare, these tactics are often very inappropriate. Uh, often there is no enemy out there. In some cases, there are. There is. <laughs> but at any rate, uh, in many cases, uh, the enemy, meaning the indigenous population, will break down into small groups that will engage in raids, uh, 
uh, will uh, attack supply lines, ambush, this sort of thing. Uh, very unconventional tactics. They will not engage you in a pitched battle, European style. And if you're to prevail, you have to adapt your tactics. If you try to approach these small guerrilla type groups uh, in, in a conventional way with large columns uh, uh, on a conventional battlefield, it isn't going to happen. Nothing, uh, you're going to be ineffective. And so the European powers where they confront this sort of enemy will adapt their tactics to it. Uh, smaller units, uh, flying columns, they will also employ raids and ambushes against uh, a guerrilla type opponent. Uh, they will adapt, in other words, to the, situ the local situation, to the people, and to the culture. Um, and also keep in mind throughout this, the military, while it's fighting the colonial wars, they're only the military is part of the larger effort, uh, which includes the political, economic instruments as well to colonize a given area. So the tactics generally tend to be unconventional. Occasionally you'll get that pitch battle, but more often than not you're going to have to adapt, un uh, adopt by adapting, uh, un or adapt by adopting unconventional tactics. Uh, the impact of all of this. Well, first of all, what happens to traditional armies who fight colonial wars? They're not prepared to fight them. They do have to adapt. What does this mean? It can be a painful process. Then once they've learned to do that, can they readapt when they have to fight a conventional war? And this is a problem you'll look at uh, when you get to World War I. Many of the European armies are oriented toward a colonial warfare, not to the big war anymore. Uh, and this is a problem. Uh, how do you take an army that uh, has, has, has been a constabulary force, a police force, a colonializing force, and uh, turn it back into a conventional army? Uh, you want to parallel the United States going into Vietnam as a conventional army. The army in Vietnam, to some extent, becomes an unconventional army, not entirely. And then you have to, after Vietnam is over, reorient it to Europe. And that took some doing in the areas of doctrine, training, force structure, etc. Uh, secondly, uh, the problem of colonial armies, can they retain the support of the nation they represent, especially in a democracy? The French uh, and the British both, but mainly the French because of the tactics they use, the emphasis on the harsh over the benevolent tactics in the French experience. Uh, the French uh, army, the colonial army, lost the support of uh, many politicians in France and uh, much of the French uh, of French society. Uh, stories of atrocities would come back to France and uh, they would be played up in the anti-imperial uh, newspapers and the army would caught a black eye uh, that we would have to live with. The Dreyfus Affair, which is another issue and explained in your instructor notes, uh, also enters into it. But uh, <clears throat> uh, can, can a colonial army, which fighting an unconventional war, which by its very nature tends to be very nasty. Torch, the use of torture, atrocities. You burn down a village, uh, many see just the act of burning it down as an atrocity. If you happen to kill some people in the process, women, children, old, old men, that doesn't go over well either back at home. And yet that's oftentimes almost inherent in the nature of unconventional warfare. It's not to excuse it, it's simply say, to say it's likely to happen. And it's not likely to play well at home. So the, the French army finds itself alienated from its own society. And again, the parallel here is, is so obvious. So the, the American army during Vietnam, when if you were in the military during the Vietnam years, uh, uh, best not show up on a university campus, certainly not in uniform. Uh, there was an anti-militarism. It did not affect the majority of the population, but a vocal minority uh, certainly made it uh, being in the military fairly rough. Uh, <clears throat> On the French side, while you're talking about it, isn't it true that at that time the French actually had two armies, one that was the Metropolitan Army of Paris, if you will, and then the other one that was the unconventional or uh, colonial army, and, right. and the right. two were didn't exactly meet in the middle. Right. Yeah, I, I gave a misimpression, I think. Uh, if you go to colonial warfare, the whole the country, the entire army of the country does not become a colonial 
colonial army any more than when we were colonizing the Philippines. Uh, the U.S. Army does not become a colonial army as a whole. Parts of it do, uh, or parts of it, uh, or many officers gain their experience in the colonial wars, but that does not mean the army itself has reoriented to become an exclusively colonial army. So, you know, quite right. The, the French have a colonial army and they have the Metropolitan Army, and there, there's a gap between the two uh, in terms of their ability to fight a traditional war. And uh, then there's a gap between the colonial army and French society because of the nature of colonial warfare, uh, especially when it goes into its harsh phase. So, yeah, uh, it, it's a little more complicated than uh, I, I was uh, laying it out. It's, uh, uh, again, uh, uh, not an entire, a nation's entire army does not become uh, a colonial army. And in fact, once you've set up a colony, oftentimes you'll find uh, friendly groups within that society to uh, uh, become a colonial force. You'll use native troops uh, to maintain order in the colony. And then you, uh, with World War I, you'll bring them over to fight in Europe. Uh, <clears throat> which is an interesting experience for them. For, uh, for many, for example, in Africa, they find in World War I, hey, they can kill white people. Uh, their bullets will kill these people. There's nothing magic about these people. They can be killed. And, uh, this lesson will be reapplied uh, again in World War II. Uh, one final point here in this overview, and that is uh, there is an assumption made on the ideological side of imperialism, and that is that Western ways, one, are universally applicable and are acceptable, or that people want to look like us. Uh, the United States will certainly carry that that ideological baggage into the colonial wars. That we're doing these folks a favor, the white man's burden. We're bringing them the benefits of Western, uh, Western uh, civilization, uh, uh, primarily the economic benefits, but also the social and political as well at some point when they're ready for them. Uh, so there's a good deal of uh, ethnocentrism here. Uh, there's a, a good deal of uh, cultural arrogance, I suppose. Ours is better, and uh, uh, because of that, uh, we have the right to impose it, and they will be grateful to us uh, either right away or in the long term uh, for doing it. So uh, that's the overview. Then you get into specific experiences, which uh, the article by Porch on the French lays out, and then uh, the material we have on the Indian Wars and the Philippines. So uh, uh, any comments on the, uh, the general approach before we well, get the first, into specific? I guess the first thing that I'd comment I'd make is that, I mean, just about now, uh, the British are handing over Hong Kong to the Chinese. I mean, one of the last bastions of the period that Larry talked about, where the, the European Western nations dominated the world, uh, this summer comes to an end. Kind of closes an ear, actually. If there was anything left of the empire, that was it. And it's gone. But I think you can use that to highlight what Larry's talking about here and taking a Chinese population and making them British. A piece I saw in the news this morning that talks about how uh, high dollar land prices in Britain, I mean, things are just being snapped up <laughs> from Chinese who grew up in Hong Kong but think of themselves as British because of the, the colonial empire and are now moving to England because they don't want to stay there. They want to stay on the British side, not on the Chinese side. So that just occurred to me. That kind of, you know, articulates what you're talking about with an example. Yeah, very much. I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, I was, I was just going to go on and say, when it, to take off on something Larry said, when I teach this block of instruction, uh, I also happen to be a, a student of guerrilla warfare, just from a little different period. And I really think you can do more than just examine uh, Gallieni, Bougeot, Latte. You can use how they deal with it, and they have different techniques of dealing with it, to show how there's no one way to deal with irregular warfare. It's very situational dependent. But understanding the culture of the, uh, the folks that you're fighting against or the people who inhabit the area you're fighting is a big help. Uh, and you can use this as a bridge to talk about, like you said, Vietnam, because we certainly don't understand the culture uh, as we go in. We make some mistakes early on in how we're going to deal with these folks. Uh, and much of it has to do, I think, with your discussion of how we look at America or the Western world is how things should be. We don't understand why other people aren't like us. We want to make them like us, like we tried in the Philippines. And it's, uh, 
it's what uh, Robert Asprey calls in his book, he calls it an ignorance of arrogance. Mm -hmm. Where, you know, we think everybody ought to be like us and we don't understand why they are, why they're not. And understanding that, I think, gives you a big leg up as a military commander in trying to deal with irregular warfare. Because it brings you from at least the correct base where you have to, what do you have to do? You have to identify your enemy and what their strengths and weaknesses are. And they have a tendency not to do that. And we see that with the French. We see it with the Americans as we deal in, in the Spanish-American War. We see it in the Indian Wars. There's certainly an arrogance there uh, with this whole colonial empire piece. Uh, that plays into it. And I think, you, I think you can use that to deal with your students. Uh, gives you a lot of different directions to go, whether it's Vietnam or wherever it is. It could be Bosnia. Mm -hmm. You could bring that in. How do you deal with the Serbs versus the Croats versus the Bosnians? Okay, and I, I think all of that, while that's not exactly in the period we're talking about, it's the idea we're talking about. So I, I use this lesson to do a lot of that, to pull things together and look at irregular warfare. Let me make two comments on what you said. Uh, uh, one has to do with the context. Uh, in the 19th century, to the West, imperialism is taken as something that's completely acceptable. Today it is not. Uh, the big watershed is World War II, and that will come later in your studies, but world, it's World War II that really uh, breaks up the, uh, begins to break up the colonial empires. Uh, decolonization takes place rapidly after World War II, and today uh, it, it, the United States could not embark on an uh, openly imperialistic venture without uh, uh, great critical debate within the country, and, and in fact it simply won't flow. The context has changed. Uh, our views toward other races, other peoples have changed uh, from uh, what were today would be racist views of the 19th century. White people are superior innately. If I were a university professor at Harvard in the 19th century, I would be telling you that as a scientifically proved fact. We don't believe that today, at least most uh, people do not. Uh, but uh, again, and thus, our policies are different. But back then, that was a prevailing belief. Thus, the white man's burden, again, was something you, you picked up, you accepted. Uh, the second thing, uh, you, uh, dealing with the nature of the military beast, uh, a couple of things. First of all, intelligence. Uh, those writing on the small wars or colonial wars, the argument is the first thing you need is a, uh, well, and you could argue this of any war, I guess, the first thing you need is really good intelligence, but intelligence for these kind of wars is often different uh, in the questions you'll ask than for traditional warfare. In these wars, as, as Jim says, the culture is tremendously important. Knowing the people and uh, how they're divided, how they interact, what their perceptions are. Uh, Marine general coming out of Somalia, indicated that uh, when he went in there, he, you know, he took his intellectual baggage, his cultural baggage, individual responsibility. And all of a sudden, he's negotiating face-to-face -face with clan leaders who don't share that view. Their culture is based upon, or part of it is based upon, the idea of communal responsibility. As he put it, if you steal a cow, uh, if an individual steals a cow, it, his clan has to answer for it to the clan from which he stole the cow. And the elders of the clan will get together to work out a settlement or not, but it's, it's not an individualistic society. And yet that was the baggage this Marine general took in, and he said it was an eye-opener to find out that uh, uh, the culture was different. Uh, he said, we're not good at cultural intelligence. For these kind of wars, you have to be. And this applies to the 19th century colonial war as much as it does to Bosnia, Somalia, Haiti today. We need to, uh, the intelligence side, we, we not only need to know where the weapons are and who, who has them and who the enemy is, you need to know the culture and the people. Uh, also, what Jim said about the nature of colonial warfare and unconventional war, the, uh, the context differs from country to country and within a country from location to location. And this is perhaps a lesson of the Philippines uh, and uh, an article which you don't read, so I'll just mention it. Uh, there's a book and several articles by a fellow named Brian Lynn. And his argument is that in the Philippines, counterinsurgency by the United States begins to work when it's applied at the local level, meaning the town and village. That a, a captain in charge of a company or a lieutenant in charge of a, what would have been a platoon back then, uh, uh, 
he has responsibility for a town or a village and he will adapt the policies coming out of Manila, the military government in Manila uh, run by the U.S. Uh, uh, he will adapt those policies as he needs to in the local situation because in his area it may be the conservative Filipinos that oppose you, it may be the liberal Filipinos that oppose you, it may be uh, uh, the, the conflict may be religiously oriented or it may not. It uh, uh, what the upper class may uh, support you in one area and oppose you in another. You have to look at each area and adapt your policies accordingly. So it gets to be very localized, it gets to be very decentralized, and there's a great deal of responsibility on the small unit leader to adapt. Uh, one overall policy, uh, whether it's benevolent or harsh, may not provide enough of a guideline to make it work at the local level. And an additive to that, this year I had a Filipino officer in my class, Lieutenant Colonel Mac McClung, and he read the Lynn article and said that, he said, you may find this hard to believe, but when we originally started fighting against the uh, communist insurrection, the insurgency in the Philippines, which they're still fighting today, he said, we tried to do it the way you first tried to do the Filipino-American War, until we realized that we, above all, should understand the culture of the people we're going against. And when we started to take it down to much smaller levels, say, well, look at this province, not the entire island, then we were much more successful. He said, what Lynn says is exactly what we found, that if we would follow the second American model, not the first one, that we would be successful in dealing with our own insurgency. And I think that's important because today uh, our small unit leaders are the ones that are going out there and they're the first interaction with the Bosnian Serbs or the Muslims uh, or the folks in Somalia. And so we have a second lieutenant, first lieutenant, captain uh, on a very small scale uh, that are the ones that are influencing. We did the same thing in Vietnam uh, later on where we, we went at the small level and, and it did make a difference if you could affect one village and take care of one village. Uh, so that, I mean we've had, we have a, a track record if you will of this. The, the problem is that this goes against the whole trend of the West. What's going, again, this gets back to the 19th century and, and in this case, the 20th as well. What's the trend? The trend is towards centralization. Whether it's political, bigger government, economic, from small businesses to corporations, it's toward centralization and, and the term rationalization, streamlining, making more efficient. And you do that by getting bigger by combining. And we're saying in this kind of war, that doesn't work. You know, this, uh, a centralized military policy isn't going to work because, uh, uh, unless it's so general that the small unit leaders can take out of it what they need to. If you try to be too specific at the, the higher level, more than likely you're not going to succeed because the, the general policy will not apply to so much of what you're try to which you're trying to apply it. Um, like so this idea of uh, approaching colonial warfare or unconventional warfare from a localized uh, perspective again runs counter to the trend the historical trend in the West which is to centralization bigness growth and uh, coordination uh, from the top yeah. it runs counter to uh the, the other things that we'll get to in uh, Minigan's fire, larger armies, an offensive doctrine, uh, those things are, are what is being taught in the schools like, you know, the equivalence of the Command and General Staff College, even though they're, they're at, during this period, the schools are just being born in all the Western armies. But you're right, man, every, how to fight unconventional warfare is on the small scale, whereas everything that's being taught is on the large scale, and you have this Dichotomy. Okay, which do you do? Which do we use at what point yeah. in time? And, and that's very hard to do. And that's true. Uh, if you look at Andrew uh, Krepinevich's book, *The Army in Vietnam*, you know it, it's 
you know, trying to get unconventional warfare through the Army, or even today, with what we call operations other than war, a term that's about to change, uh, just to something else just as vague in general, uh, again, there's a resistance to that. Uh, you want the big Army to fight the big war. The problem is throughout m most of our history, it's this sort of issue, whether it's colonial warfare or small wars or interventions, that's what the military does most. You've got to be ready to fight the big war, but this sort of thing is more than likely what you'll end up doing in your career. And it takes a different mindset and a different approach. The Indian Wars, mm -hmm. now, you know, this is just stuck into the lesson. Uh, we don't colonize the West, or do we? Uh, so when you look at the Indian Wars, one question you might raise with the students and use as a basis for discussion is what, in what way do the Indian Wars look very uh, similar to the colonial wars? Are they in fact colonial wars? And then uh, how are they fought? And again, as in the colonial experience, you'll find both conventional and unconventional warfare. In some cases, conventional warfare, three converging columns, works. In other cases, it's a recipe for disaster, down south especially against the Apache, where Crick will ad ad adopt unconventional tactics to go after them. It's, it's a mixed bag. It's, it's not simple in any of these cases. But there are trends that emerge, and uh, uh, one is that very rarely do you fight a traditional conventional battle on uh, a traditional conventional battlefield. So again, a comparison of the U.S. Indian Wars to colonial warfare, even though we generally don't think of them as colonial wars. Mm -hmm. Good point. Any other comments? No, why don't we move on? Okay. okay. Well, let's talk uh, men against fire. Uh, up until this point, we've really looked at the colonial warfare piece uh, in the U.S., in uh, Western Europe, uh, and Western Europe is really colonizing uh, Africa, the United States. You can argue that it was colonizing uh, the, the western part of the United States, and then the Philippines, Cuba, and Puerto Rico. Uh, during this piece, as we move to the, this men against fire piece, uh, we start looking at different things. We start looking at uh, industry, which has just grown dramatically, especially in the second half uh, of uh, the, the 19th century. Uh, we look at, uh, as you said, different ideologies, social Darwinism uh, that we look at. We look at armies that are very, very big uh, fighting at least in Europe, they do fight that pitched, standing battle uh, that we all want, that we all want to do. To do. Uh, we look at an offensive uh, doctrine, uh, and we look at a lot of the different wars that happened during this uh, period: uh, the Franco-Prussian War, uh, the Austro-Prussian War. Um, you have the Russo-Japanese War. Uh, you can look at the Boer War uh, and, and contrast all of those. What comments do, can you lend either one of you for those? Oh, we there. Oh, okay. uh, well, uh, uh, the idea, of, again, uh, looking at these trends of the uh, 19th century and focusing on one particular uh, industrialization and a product of that, uh, the new military technology. As I said earlier, technology will now begin, technological change will now begin to have a, a, a very pronounced impact on military affairs, more so than it has previously uh, in the uh, 18th and 19th, or, or excuse me, 18th century that we've looked at up to now. Uh, and with the, uh, the technology from railroads, which allow you to have larger armies and to transport them to down to the tactics, rifles, which make the battlefield, or rifles and artillery, uh, various types of artillery, which make the battlefield much more lethal. And this men against fire implies that's what we're going to be focusing upon is the battlefield here. And how has that changed? And uh, the critical word, I think, is lethality. It's become a much more deadly place on, on which to conduct your affairs. Uh, much more deadly than, or deadlier than the uh, Napoleonic battlefield where uh, because of the uh, inaccuracy of muskets, you can volley fire, but hitting the target is problematical. With a rifle, you can hit the target. If you, if you take the time to aim, you can hit your target fairly easily. 
uh, I may be overstating that uh, given the confusion of the battlefield, but uh, in theory at least, the rifle is much more accurate and of longer range than the musket. That's a fact. The theory is whether or not it's actually uh, more lethal. Um, but uh, you've got this problem of lethality, and the question then is how will soldiers or troops survive on a more lethal battlefield? What do you have to do? What tactics do you have to adopt? Uh, what position do you have to take? Is, is the offense better than the defense, uh, given the new technology? And if, if uh, the offense is better, what should you do? Uh, how should the troops be, uh, uh, how should the units be organized? How should uh, they be, how should the tactics be? set up for a more lethal battlefield. And uh, we saw in the American Civil War adjustments being made, looser formations, skirmishers uh, in much greater numbers than you had in the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, uh, you, you look for cover. You just don't march so shoulder to shoulder across a field. You, you, you take off and when you need to, you go to ground and uh, uh, find cover. Uh, and uh, you can stay down uh, thanks to the fact now you've got a cartridge you can load while lying down you don't have to stand up uh, to take out your powder horn or your whatever and, and all of those uh, mechanics of loading a, a, a smooth bore musket uh, but now you've got a rifle with a cartridge uh, you can do that from the ground and so many people go to cover uh, the thing is you've got to adapt and, and, and the question is but how do you do it? what's best is the offense better than the defense well when you start seeing the results of the more lethal battlefield, for example, in the Russo-Japanese War, you would tend to, to the conclusion that to be on the defense is uh, to be in the winning position. You can slaughter anybody coming at you with uh, rifles and later machine guns uh, by the time the Japanese uh, Russo-Japanese War machine guns uh, and a more accurate artillery. You can kill anybody trying to get uh, trying to come to your position, uh, and vice versa if you try to get to the other side they will kill you, so best to be on the defensive. That would seem to be the lesson, but that's not the lesson taken out of it. Going into the 20th century and into World War I, most uh, of the Western countries are still looking at the offense as critical, and if the battle feels more lethal, which they all recognize, they weren't ignorant of that, we can find ways to overcome it. And how do you do it? Mainly, technology will simply have more bullets to shoot at them than they at us, and two, morale or esprit. French uh, Elan. Elan. If, if you're a Frenchman, you can win because you are a Frenchman, and the other person isn't. And so uh, uh, the, the issue of morale, and, and this raises the whole issue of people under fire. Can they maintain that esprit? Can they maintain the morale, the willingness to sacrifice that will get them across a lethal battlefield and into the enemy's uh, position? And th that's uh, uh, a question what Dupique addresses, uh, looking at the psychological factors. He calls them the moral factors. Don't read morale into that. Read psychological. When he says moral, he means, well, I guess you're not going to read Dupique anyway. So uh, there's if there's a, a reference to it. There's reference in their notes. Uh, if there's reference to it, uh, you'll find a reference to moral factors, but read psychological and not morale into uh, moral. But that raises the whole issue of troops under fire. How will they perform? And how can you get the best out of them? Small units uh, where they can see their leader? Do you lead from the front, from the rear? How do you communicate with them uh, in a battlefield that's going to be very noisy? Uh, and how do you keep them moving forward instead of backward or downward, which would be the natural inclination coming under fire is either to turn and run or to dig in. And how do you do that? Yeah, and the weapon systems that Larry talks about, uh, sometimes it's hard for people of our day and age to understand that the changes here. I mean, the European wars that that preceded World War I, uh, the Franco-Prussian War particularly, is where you start to see this newer, better artillery. Uh, artillery which has recoil systems so that they don't roll out of place every time they're fired, which allows many more rounds to go down range, and all of them being breech loading instead of being muzzle loading. So when you look uh, from a logistics perspective at the Prussian, Franco-Prussian War, it's the first time ever that the ability to fire ammunition uh, outruns the ability to provide it. Uh, 
uh, infantry ammunition is not a problem. I mean, the average soldier in the in the German army, when he cranks out in the Franco-Prussian War, uh, has enough ammunition on him to finish the war. I mean, most of them don't fire more than 80 or 90 rounds, and they're carrying a basic load of 126 in the Russian in the German army. But it's the artillery ammunition that makes such a gross difference with these huge weapon systems that fire on Paris as the war comes towards an end. And you just uh, von Moltke's trains cannot get enough ammunition. Well, that you know that's kind of the precursor that that should have told them something about war, because as Larry says, uh, you'll you'll look at the Schlieffen plan the next time out. But I mean. I mean, this whole plan had everything swinging right, and there were a grand total of four roads and two rails behind these two army groups up there. And uh, there was no way they could get everything shoved into those little holes, those, those little bottlenecks they've got. But they just don't come to understand it. The French call it Elan, but everybody is, it's the, you know, it's that offensive mindedness, mm -hmm. and they can't get away from the it. The can do. Oh yeah, they're, I mean, they're still riding horse cavalry mm -hmm. as the war begins. And you've got, you know, the, the lances and the sabers and, and all of this. Well, it'll soon be, that spirit will be taken up by the guys in uh, Fulker triplanes with their scarves flying in the breeze. But the attitude is still the same. It's the, it's the offensive minded, it's not manly to sit back and wait and shoot someone. The way you fight this is by offensive spirits hitting each other. And it, you know, it, it's telling that as you, lead, you, as you start the first battles of the war, you have the Germans attacking with the Schlieffen plan, and you have the French planning to attack also. I mean, that side which is being attacked, its pre-done plans call for it to attack also. And that's, that's I think, edifying in what Larry talks about. Uh, even though you're being attacked, you're the French, you're being attacked, you're outnumbered, you're outgunned, your answer to this is still, well, I'll attack them, right? And that goes along with the ideas and the attitudes that go into this. Now, one weapon that, that we haven't talked about much, and it's, you know, you really, most of you will not even have seen one because they haven't been in our army for a very long time, and that's a water-cooled machine gun. Mm -hmm. And when we think about machine guns today, we think about M60s, we think about 50 cals. Weapon systems, you've got to change barrels on fairly regularly. You've got to understand what a, a water-cooled machine gun could do. I mean, a 30 caliber water-cooled machine gun could fire 400 rounds a minute cyclic. And as long as you put a belt into it and you kept water in the, in the jacket, and there was a guy in the crew whose mission was to keep water in the jacket, you could fire at that all day long. You could fire it at that rate. So as you start this charge across open ground, and it, it happened in the Russo-Japanese War, and there's a number of interlocking uh, water-cooled machine guns, just imagine they can put out 400 rounds a minute off a tripod with a T and E mechanism, so they're exceedingly accurate. Uh, I have a tape of one taking out a four by four in about a two second burst and just ripping it to shreds. And think what that could do to an infantry assault starting across. And, uh, but that just wasn't picked up. It's like in the Boer War, that, that was just kind of a, it was an aberration. Well, there's, uh, you know, raising this idea of the frontal assault mm -hmm. uh, becomes almost suicidal, even though, again, nobody's willing to admit it until World War I. And even then, uh, as you'll see when you get to it, every time you attack and get repulsed, the idea is we'll just throw more at them the next time and it'll work. Uh, well, what do you do if you can't attack them frontally and you have to attack? Well, obviously, you hit them on the flank. The problem is they can adjust the rifles and the artillery to the flank uh, and be just as deadly. So uh, the, the solution to the forward attack, which is to simply go around and envelop them or hit them on the flank, you can't do it any more easily than you can get at them from the front. Uh, it can be just as deadly. Uh, Another thing Jim said about uh, logistics, there were those like, uh, help me out on the French, Bloch, Bloch or Bloch, 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 Jean Bloch. Uh, who are, are arguing that war has become too costly. Uh, uh, one, in terms of just natural resources, in terms of the logistics involved. It, it's going to take so much of your natural resources to fight a war. 
uh, it, it becomes counterproductive to fight. Uh, secondly, it will disrupt trade. Uh, it'll, uh, all the mechanisms that make life what it is uh, will, be a casual, uh, will be casualties of war. Uh, it's become too complex. Uh, Blo Block is arguing that uh, war has become anachronistic, that it's become so lethal and so uh, financially costly, so costly in resources and in manpower that uh, a war, if it's not short, uh, will become, uh, well, it will be short because you'll have to end it. You can't afford to continue it financially or in terms of your manpower. And uh, much of what he said about the battlefield came true in World War I. What didn't come true was it wasn't a short war. All sides showed that they were willing to make the sacrifices in manpower and in resources to continue the war, even though there was no end in sight. Uh, but in every other respect, or in many other respects, Block was very prescient. The problem is much of what he had to say about the lethality of the battlefield was dismissed because he was a civilian. And uh, the military experts were not willing to listen to that. Yeah. Uh, one point on uh, the minute against fire I want to get in here in terms of the teaching method, and that is uh, a question that I found uh, that can generate discussion, although the lesson itself, just what does it take to fight, should generate a lot of discussion, uh, is that to make a comparison with today's battlefield. What if we had fought the Russians in the Fulda Gap? We have doctrine for it. Uh, uh, air land battle, we had doctrine, air land battle. We're going to maneuver. We're going to get into the, the rear areas. We're going to disrupt their command uh, and, and control their communications, this sort of thing. Well, all that sounds great. A highly uh, mobile maneuvering uh, force. What happens when you're in your Abrams or your uh, Bradley and you see that first uh, mushroom cloud from a tactical nuke? You're going to keep going forward? Are you going to head to the rear or start digging down? And many who uh, were looking at the possibility of World War III uh, before ICBMs, at least, got involved, uh, before you would have a nuclear exchange, but looking at it on the battlefield, many were arguing World War III would look much more like World War I than World War II. It would become a static war because as soon as the tactical nukes started going off, which was more or less built into the, the doctrine, uh, it, was, it would be, uh, been almost impossible to avoid the use of tactical nukes. Once you start seeing those, you're going to dig in and get the safety, just self-preservation. You're not going to be out there maneuvering around because when one of those goes off, you're dead. I mean, it's not like a bullet. You know, Maybe it'll get you, maybe it won't. It'll get you. <laughs> the fireball's going to take you and everybody around you. And so the natural reaction would have been to dig in or to run, but better perhaps to dig in. And you may end up with not a continuous trench, but a series of dug-in positions and a static war. Uh, you know, didn't happen, so we don't know. But there are those who argue, you know, what would it have taken to motivate people to go out into a nuclear battlefield where you're looking at something of the same question back then when you're having to face rifles and machine guns and more accurate artillery, which you haven't seen before. Now, Larry brought up uh, Yvonne Block in the, in the discussion of how war had become so costly it would not go on. And you might question why uh, why the leaders of Germany and France had not learned anything from the American Civil War. Okay, a war which everyone thought would be short. The, uh, you know, the stories of the picnics on the hills over First Manassas. And I mean, and those stories are true. Uh, it, it wasn't believed to be going to be the, the, you know, damaging war that it turned out to be. Well, that war is basically, in Europe, is basically put aside as just, you know, rabble running around the wilderness, and these weren't European armies. And much the way Larry talked about how we look at the Filipinos or the Cubans as somewhat less than us, the Europeans look at the American army in the same way, as an unorganized rabble. So while there may have been some lessons on lethality from on that battlefield, which could have been learned and could have helped the Europeans in, you know, take a look at what defense did towards the end of the war, uh, they didn't learn the lesson because they chose to dismiss those people who were not them. All right, and that, that's a theme, underestimating people is a theme throughout military history. Okay, and it shows up here again because they, they dismiss that war, they don't use it at all, and what they end up doing is a much bigger version of Petersburg 
by the time they're done because of newer weapons, larger amounts of manpower. Uh, but you still get basically what you have around Petersburg in 1865, an incredible trench system that you just, you know, eventually Grant finds his way around. Well, you can't in Europe come, uh, come in the middle of the trench period because it goes from the, uh, what, from the Baltic all the way down to the Alps. There's nowhere to go around right. by the time you get there. So once, they, once this offensive mindedness we talked about proves to run out of steam, short of Paris, uh, then you're destined to have Petersburg on a huge scale because people just don't learn uh, from people that, that aren't them. It's not the same experience. Uh, all right. Um, concluding remarks. I'll kind of wrap this up and uh, get us on the road and, and get you all out of here. Uh, we've looked at two very significant uh, areas. We looked at colonial warfare and what we've looked against uh, men against fire. The period that we're looking at is a is a broad period. It's a lot of time uh, from the end of the Civil War uh, to right at the beginning of the uh, World War One. Uh, so you've got a lot of maneuver space out there that you can get through. The readings that we have assigned cover everything uh, in a general way. Uh, there are more readings uh, or there's an extra bibliography uh, in the instructor notes uh, in the instructor packet that you can look. Uh, if you don't have the time to do it, assign some of these extra readings like Ivan Block uh, and Depic uh, to students and let them give you know a three to five seven minute uh, presentation on what they've learned. Um, the things that we look the things that we're looking at are still subjects that we that we look at today. Um, men against fire. We have a very lethal battlefield today. How do we get our soldiers to get out there and fight? Colonial warfare. We're, we're still fighting that. Yes, Hong Kong is one of the last bastions of, uh, of uh, colonialism to be given up, at least for the British. How about for the United States? The United States still owns Puerto Rico. It's not a foreign country. It is part of the United States, and yet it is not part of the United States. How do you look at issues like that? Uh, Larry made a good point. Economically, do we have colonies that are economically beholding to the U.S.? Again, these are all things that we've done before, a hundred years ago, a little more than a hundred years ago, but they're still applicable today. Uh, we don't need to keep reinventing the wheel. And with that, I think I'll close it. Thank you very much. Uh, enjoy the rest of the tapes.